China is expected to cut a key lending rate today, and all eyes this week will be on the Fed's Jay Powell, who will kick off the annual Jackson Hole shindig on Friday. That's coming up in our five things in five minutes. And then we have a bonus deep dive interview with Adelaide Timbrell about why Australian house prices are rising again, despite the RBA's rate hikes. We have around 2% population growth due to very strong net migration in Australia, but the amount of residential building activity in the latest data was actually at its weakest since 2020. So there's not more being built compared to usual, but there is more demand than usual, and that's putting real pressure on housing supply. But first, in 5 and 5 with ANZ, number one, ANZ Group's chief economist Richard Yitzinger says a key event to watch today will be the People's Bank of China's setting of a key interest rate, the one-year prime rate. One is China's one-year loan prime rate announcement on Monday. Not something you'd normally have in your data calendar, but of course right now with with questions about the strength of China's economy, it's going to be quite an important announcement. Number two, later in the week, the focus will be on US Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell, who will give a speech to open the weekend conference for the world's central bankers at Jackson Hole in the United States. This time, a lot of focus on the neutral interest rate. The divergence between the world's two largest economies right now is as stark as I've ever seen it. It's hard to believe that divergence will persist. What's going to give way, the signs of resilience and strength in the US or the excessive signs of weakness in China? That's what markets are going to be puzzling over. Number three, that gap between the growth rates in the United States and China is something currency markets are totally focused on. The dollar still has quite a bit of support, not just from the weakness in China, which is directly impacting currencies like Aussie, Kiwi, and in fact, the Asian complex, Remimbi itself all directly affected by that China story, but also at the same time, you just get enough hints in the US numbers that the US economy may not quite be slowing enough for the Fed. The dollar's in uh, getting a couple of tailwinds and, and the commodity and risk currencies a couple of headwinds. Number four, Japan's CPI inflation figures were in line with expectations on Friday. ANZ's head of FX research, Marja Bin Zaman, says that means the Bank of Japan won't have to add more tweaks to its yield curve control program. It's actually the yen that the markets will be watching. No reason for them to shift. In fact, we continue to see, I think the yen has been weakening over the past week or so. We're at key levels, 145. And these, these are levels where the BOJ previously intervened last year. And this is not this is more driven not by domestic factors, but more or less from global factors. U.S. Treasury yields are at record highs. And obviously, the widening interest rate differential between Japan and U.S. is probably the key driver of dollar yen. Number five, Marjabin is also keeping a close eye on the CNH, the Rinminbi, the overseas traded version of China's yuan currency. The news that the PBOC asked state banks to ramp up FX intervention. And today they have actually followed up with the strongest fixing bias relative to expectations. That's around 1,041 pips stronger than the expectation uh, or the Bloomberg survey, at least. They also released a Q2 monetary policy report last night in which they mentioned, the PBOC mentioned, that it will prevent over-adjustment in the currency. And the central bank has the right tools to maintain orderly function of FX market. So this suggests that maybe authorities may be preparing to draw a line in the sand or defend the currency from further weakness. ANZ's head of FX research, Marjabin Zaman there. Now for our bonus deep dive interview, my colleague Catherine Dyer talks with ANZ senior Australian economist Adelaide Timbrell about why house prices have been rising since mid-February. That's despite the RBA lifting the cash rate into restrictive territory at 4.1%. Adelaide says it's all about housing shortages. We can see evidence of that in the very tight rental market, as well as sluggish building activity and strong population growth. So lots of people moving to Australia, but not a lot of extra homes being built. 
These um, dynamics seem to be outweighing the impacts of cash rate increases. We also know that while there is a, a lot more to pay for the average household in Australia, whether that's higher grocery costs, higher utility costs, or higher mortgage interest payments, that inflation and interest rate change for household cash flows has not translated into a huge amount of listings. There's not a lot of people out there who are selling their home due to those changes in cash flow. And what that means is that whether you're buying or renting, you've really got very few homes to choose from and that creates um, a bit more competition between buyers, which is then raising those prices. Why do you think there are so few houses coming onto the market at the moment? In terms of new homes being built, we've seen elongated building times, a higher cost of funding for new developments um, and and the, as well as some insolvencies in the construction sector. These are really undermining the developer incentives to add supply to the market. So even though there's a lot of buyers out there, developers are still facing a lot of extra costs and, and may not get a return um, on their investment the way they did when funding costs were lower and when building times were shorter. In terms of listing of established homes, um, generally when housing prices are heating up, we see more people put their homes on the market. And when the housing market is cooler, we see people take their homes off or delay putting their homes on the market because um, we are seeing housing prices lower than what they were at their peak in mid-2022. We're still probably yet to see the impact of rising housing prices on listings so far. So does that mean that there are just not enough houses being built for the population growth? Absolutely. We're facing a sharpening housing shortage in Australia. So what we're seeing in the rental market is very, very low vacancy rates. That means it's very difficult to get a rental. We have around 2% population growth due to very strong net migration in Australia. But the amount of residential building activity in the latest data was actually at its weakest since 2020. So there's not more being built compared to usual, but there is more demand than usual. And that's putting real pressure on housing supply. We also are finding that people have spread out a little bit into the housing supply as well. So by that, I mean people who were living in a two-bedroom space might be living in a three-bedroom space now for a bit of work from home area. We also know that there are fewer share houses there than there were before, which is again likely uh, the impact of both COVID lockdowns, but also flexible working conditions. So people are using their homes differently, which means per person, there needs to be a little bit more home that people want to rent or buy. And that's also putting extra pressure on supply. There's just more space needed, more people, but not really more homes coming onto the market. How much of the 400 basis points and rate hikes has actually been passed on through mortgages? Around 25% of the increase in the cash rate from the Reserve Bank did not pass through to our average outstanding loan. Now, part of the reason for that is we do have some fixed rate loans from 2020 and 2021 still on the market. So people still paying two or two and a half percent that will over the next six to 12 months start paying closer to six percent based on the average outstanding rate. And it's also partly because of competition, which was quite fierce between financial institutions in the mortgage market. ANZ Senior Australian Economist Adelaide Timbrell. I'm Bernard Hickey. That was Five and Five with ANZ for Monday, August the 21st. Catch you tomorrow for more on how the People's Bank of China is supporting its economy and its currency. This podcast was recorded for publication on behalf of ANZ. All associated disclosures and disclaimers can be viewed using the link in your media player or the ANZ website through which you access this podcast. All care has been taken to report the views of ANZ Research in the creation of this podcast, but as an independent host, any differing interpretations are strictly mine and not ANZ's. Feel free to contact your ANZ point of contact with any questions.